Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to hold questions until the end. We really do. We should have plenty of time for Q&A. And I know that that's probably what a lot of you are here to do today. Uh, so thank you all for coming. We're really excited for your interest um, in this RFP. Uh, so I'll start off with a brief introduction to who we are in this RFP and then move into some housekeeping items on um, the application process and then what the project development pipeline is going to look like from a successful application from there. Then I'll pass it over to Dana to give you some uh, guidance on how to put together a great proposal and we'll really try to leave plenty of time for Q&A at that point before we wrap up. So the FNIH was founded by, founded by Congress in 1990 to advance the mission of the NIH by creating alliances and public-private partnerships. So um, we do not give you money. We are not a grant-giving institution, but what we really do is bring together institutions from academia and government and industry to put together uh, collaborations that might not be able to happen otherwise. And so that's what uh, this process will ultimately lead to, um, a collaboration, not a grant. So the Biomarkers Consortium is one of the FNIH partnerships aimed at bridging the gap between basic research and practical need in drug development. We're pre-competitive, so um, not interested in advancing any one company's bottom line. And it's really important that any work that we fund or uh, help to get funding for and support is made public as quickly as possible. Our projects are very well-defined, um, very structured. We have goals and milestones that we set up and we have predetermined go no go funding gates that come along. Uh, so it's not basic research, it's very well structured. And to date, we've had over 35 projects come out of the Biomarkers Consortium. The Biomarkers Consortium is headed by the Executive Committee, which oversees steering committees in four therapeutic areas. These steering committees form working groups, which stand up projects. And those projects are then governed by both the steering committee and the Executive Committee. You're here today for an RFP from the Cancer Steer Steering Committee High, Conta High Content Data Integration Working Group, whose mission is standing up pilot projects to test analytically validated platforms, employing emerging technologies to overcome limitations of establishing biomarker methodologies. So we're really looking for proposals that will uh, develop technologies to address clinical challenges. Again, there's a time and place for uh, doing basic research, and this is um, not quite it. I'm sure you've already reviewed the RFP and the clinical challenges, but we're looking for proposals that touch on and address at least one of the three that we've identified. The first being tissue imaging to characterize tumors in the tumor microenvironment, uh, blood-based and remote sensing techniques or technologies to replace or augment uh, biopsy, and finally, patient screening to identify predictive biomarkers for adverse effects leading to discontinuation of clinical trials. Again, uh, we award contracts, not grants. Um, funding will come along the way if the, the project ultimately gets to launch. But just to be clear, um, there is a process before that happens and there is no pot of money that you're applying for in this process here. Uh, so applications are due on February 15th. We'll be reviewing them uh, in the working group through April 5th. From there, we'll let you know if you've been identified as a finalist and we'll invite you to present to the working group on either May 3rd, June 7th, or August 2nd. You don't need to be at all of those, but if you could pencil those dates in your calendar and try to be available for at least one of them, if you're uh, invited to come and present, that would be really helpful. Uh, we'll let you know by September if you've made it through that process and getting it through the working group means that you'll be referred on to the Cancer Steering Committee and Executive Steering Committees for review. And so that'll put you into more of the, more along the lines of the, the project development pipeline. I should note that unfortunately we are not uh, available or not able to meet with you to give you proposal specific guidance before you submit. Um, that's just not something that we're able to do. So projects will be reviewed by the working group. And if there is interest by a broad representation of working group members, um, we'll recommend that you move on to review by the Cancer Steering Committee. Importantly, the projects that we review are not in competition with each other because there is no pot of money that you're uh, asking for funding from. 
Um, and because all of our work is done fundraising for projects on an individual basis, um, we can stand up as many or as few projects as we have the bandwidth to do. So again, you're not in competition with the other proposals. If you are approved and make it through the working group, um, you'll go to the CSC for review and approval. Then uh, you'll be reviewed by the executive committee. And if your concept is approved, that's the point where you really start to work uh, a lot more closely with the, the HCDI working group to formalize your project plan. So that's where you'll start to have a um, more mature budget and timeline and milestone decision points. That's also the point at which we'll get more serious about putting together a project team. And those project teams typically include at least three industry funding partners, as well as uh, representatives from government and academic institutions. Projects will typically have two co-chairs at that point. One will be a PI and one will be a representative from uh, NCI or from industry. Uh, we'll ask you to work with the project team to refine the goals and make sure that what you're proposing to do in your plan is aligned with the FNIH mission, as well as uh, the interest of industry funding partners. As everyone comes along, you might imagine that there will be opinions um, and as interests come, the project will probably evolve uh, to, to reflect those and to reflect the, the growing team. So uh, it's likely that the project concept that you submit will be different from what ultimately might get launched as a project. After you've developed that plan, you'll go back to the Cancer Steering Committee for review. Uh, and ultimately, upon approval, you'll go to the EC before being able to launch. Along the way, the FNIH will be working to solicit funding from industry funding partners to get the funding for that project. And so that's where the funding ultimately comes from, is uh, from us reaching out to those industry funding partners that come on board to join the project team as well, to work with you. And so the FNIH will be overseeing the project goals and progress, and we'll ask that you submit quarterly progress updates along the way. So here, this is mapping everything out and hopefully something that makes the process a little bit more clear. So essentially, you'll be coming in through the working group, and that's where your proposal will be reviewed. If you make it through the working group process, uh, we'll take you into concept development where things will be fleshed out a little bit further. And then you'll go through those concept reviews at, uh, from the Cancer Steering Committee and the Executive Steering Committee. Then you'll go into project plan development and then potentially go to the CSC um, maybe once, maybe a couple of times to make sure that that gets uh, approved and is aligned with their interests. And then ultimately you'll need executive committee approval before you actually launch the project and start doing the work. Along the way, as I mentioned, we'll be working to secure funding partners and making sure that we're aligning with their interests. At this point, we're really looking for a project overview. So shown here are some components um, that would be developed further as you progress along the project development pipeline. We'll give you more guidance on that as your project moves along. But really, right now, we're looking for an overview and with that, I will turn it over to Dana to uh, tell you about how to write a great proposal. Great, thanks Althea, appreciate it. Um, so great overview of the biomarkers consortium, how we fit into the foundation for the National Institutes of Health and this process of approval. Um, so to, to the points that she made, um, we really want to work with you to develop your project proposal into what will be a concept that can be reviewed by the Cancer Steering Committee and the Executive Committee, and then into a project plan that has all the pieces that are needed to secure funding. So as you noted, we don't have any money to give you, uh, but what we can do is utilize our network to find interested parties who want to participate in your project plan and want to fund that work. And so we want to work with you to make sure that your, your best foot is forward for, for asking for those funds. And we're going to help you go through that process. So here are some, some things to keep in mind as you put your proposal together, um, some attributes that are going to be important. <clears throat> so for one, um, you may want to think about designing a project in phases to demonstrate initially that, uh, the potential of your platform and then how continuation of that proposal could then lead to more expansive projects uh, that have milestones or go-to-go -go decisions in between. This gives 
companies or partners that we talk to an opportunity to weigh in and say, well, that initial piece or that pilot is really of interest, but this middle piece isn't, but this, this third one is, and then we can kind of tailor the proposal <clears throat> to the interests of those who, who want to come on board. Um, it also gives us a way to think through funding as well, how, how each of those pieces can, can be funded or if they should be funded through this mechanism or sometimes early work, maybe we might recommend that you do that through grant funding that might be existing or we kind of can point them in the direction of alternative funding that might help and then utilizing the Biomarkers Consortium development process for, for later work. We, as Althea mentioned, we will require that there are multiple institutions involved, and that there are multiple principal investigators or co-investigators. Um, we'll want at least one clinician, but as Althea noted, we'd like to see our, our definition of a consortium is largely three industry partners and three um, uh, research sites. That kind of indicates to us that there's a, a broad-based um, input and, and also expertise that's, that's going on. If you are alone at your institution and you have a great proposal that's ripe for collaboration with partners, don't worry. Please submit your proposal. We want to see it and we can help you find those alternative partners. But just be ready that we are not going to provide funds to a single PI um, site-driven R01 type grant. We're gonna we're going to turn it into a consortium-based activity with these multiple partners. Go ahead and indicate the development status of the platform, especially if there's a technology platform that you're, you're involving. We want to know about the validation status, any publications that you have about it, um, demonstration of the analytical validation is a minimum requirement that we'll need, and then feasibility as well. Um, if you have activity in a clinical setting, and then standardization information will be helpful. It's important to focus on kind of practical translational approaches here. Um, as Althea mentioned, really early uh, basic science research is not gonna be a great fit here. We want it, it should be translatable um, and should have clinical applications. And we'll wanna hear about those. Um, maybe there are multiple, maybe you have multiple biomarkers in mind that this uh, technology could support. That's okay, but give us an indication of what, what, a, what your hypothesis is. How, what would a, a biomarker come out of this look like? What would the context of use be? and then we'll work with you to, to kind of get there. Uh, and then um, note that intended use uh, if you can. And if you, but, but expect it to change, right? So put in the intended use of the biomarker where you wanna to get to, um, because that'll help us think about what regulatory and FDA input might look like. Uh, but it, it, it may very well change over time depending on what the input that we receive from the other partners is and, and industry input as well. Uh, next. So you're right, uh, please review the RFP. Uh, proposal should be two to three pages in length. We are very much aware that you cannot put, put an entire scientific proposal into two to three pages and we've asked this specifically. Um, obviously there's a lot of folks on this call, there's a lot of interest. We're only gonna be able to, uh, or we expect that we'll be able to put forward multiple projects. And again, they're not competing with each other, but um, not everyone's is gonna fit into this model. And so we don't wanna waste your time putting a lot of effort designing like an R01 type grant proposal. when what we're really looking for is just a quick idea of what the overview of your, of your proposal might be. So then we can come back to you and talk about it and decide what the next steps are best uh, suited to make it into a, a consortium based proposal. So the pieces that we think are most important at this point are really that project overview, just an overview of what, what you envision um, any pieces of the scientific design in particular that we should know about, um, the experimental plan, the platform itself, that any technology that's involved, um, anything we should know about pre-existing IP or, or potential IP development that you think is pertinent for us to know, um, any definitions of success or, or what the aims might look like. If you have suggestions on what milestone decisions could look like and what the criteria for those, that decision making would be, that'll be helpful for us to be able to evaluate as well. Um, and then finally, make sure that you include uh, a presumed budget and a presumed timeline. We indicated, of course, that we think two to three million dollars over two to three years is kind of a sweet spot, right, that we're able to fund. We have funded projects that are larger. We've funded projects that are much smaller and shorter. Um, but note that we are gonna be going out to industry and asking them for money. So we need to have a clear ask. 
we need to be able to justify that ask and uh, the sky is not the limit, right? Uh, no company is going to come back and say, here, take my $50 million and run with this fantastic, uh, you know, uh, herbs and zoos uh, So we'll, we'll want to know what your thoughts are and then expect that to change over time. We envision that we will finalize the budget by adding additional partners on, by listening to what industry has to say, whether it's a feasible budget or not, and then we'll help you to curate that to, to get a final budget through the project development process. Um, and then lastly, note any existing commercial or funding relationships that are that are relevant that you think should be put out there. There's no reason, I can't think of any reason why an existing relationship would preclude you from being able to have a partnership, but it's helpful for us to know uh, what your network looks like so that then we can help you build upon it. Uh, here's a few notes just on design of what we think are successful projects. So uh, there should be a large unmet need and that should be able, you should be able to articulate that clearly. It should be a pre-competitive opportunity uh, that really advances the field. So as Althea noted, we work on behalf of the NIH. Everything that we do is going to be published and it's important that we're working in the public good. So we are not building a technology platform for you to be able to commercialize it and get rich. Uh, and a lot of times how we kind of figure that out is by having those multiple industry partners on. We're not supporting the bottom line of an individual company. We're doing something that uh, multiple companies probably want to do, but maybe can't do on their own. And we can help move this faster and cheaper for everyone to really get to the end result for the patient and for biomarker development. Uh, by the same token, there should probably be multiple public sector co-PIs um, again, if you're a single PI and you don't have a network, that's what we're here to do is to help you create one, but bring your friends along, right? We want to make sure that there's a, a lot of perspective here and that there's um, plenty of, of room to, to add additional perspective as we move forward. Each of those stakeholders will likely be looking to figure out what they're going to get out of this, right? A company wants to move its bottom line forward. They want to do it cheaply. They want to do it quickly. An individual investigator wants to be able to move their science forward, right? So be thinking from those perspectives. While we're going to be, while we're building team science here, uh, everyone has their own, their own target. And we want to help everyone reach those targets so that collectively we can move forward together. Um, You'll want to leverage as many resources as you can too. If there's, uh, if you're seeking samples, let's talk about what existing resources are out there for you to be able to get samples. If you need retrospective trial level data, we might be able to work with you to find uh, companies who can support that or individual institutions who may already have that data. So um, not everything has to be built from the ground up and that's one way that we're able to keep these projects relatively inexpensive and nimble. Um, we will want to have strong interest from the public sector and regulatory sector. We have close ties with the FDA and the Biomarker Qualification Program, so we'll be talking to them about what their interest is. We'll make sure that there is a regulatory representative on the project team before we launch, and so we can help curate all that, but be thinking in those terms. That's why we want to know what the biomarker is, what the context of use is, because that'll help us have those conversations. And um, lastly, make sure that that context of use for the biomarker is, we're gonna to wanna to define that early. So any thoughts that you have now that you can put in your proposal will be really helpful. Um, I mentioned that we will publish anything that happens. That's part of uh, our mandate, but uh, publication really isn't our goal here, right? We really wanna move biomarker qualification down the pipeline. We wanna support drug development tools. We wanna to support uh, clinical trials. And so, there's on the right here some lists of deliverables that we have seen from earlier projects that you might think about as far as the deliverables for your project. Not just drug advancement, but then uh, we've developed guidance documents. We've supported the qualification process and taking biomarkers through qualification, um, clinical use, uh, drug development tools, the citations, of course, and then publications are almost always come along with those, but those are the primary. Um, some criteria that you'll want to think about when it comes to developing your concept are the suitability for this model, right? If you're on this webinar and you're thinking, well, this probably isn't a good fit for my work, then we probably won't think it's a good fit for your work either. We're excited about seeing your proposals, but uh, think about the suitability for what you're hearing here. Um, the scientific importance, of course, you 
I, I'm sure that you, you know, you believe that your work is important and we do too, but we're gonna have to justify that to the folks that we are seeking funding from. And uh, the clinical importance will roll, roll into that as well. Um, as Althea mentioned, we are really not looking for early science research, but really some translational work that will have clinical relevance. And so be thinking in that vein, um, if it's not already in your proposal, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna see that. And it could easily uh, be a criteria that would knock uh, a proposal out if we really don't see uh, clinical importance. Regulatory importance as well, we're happy to help you flesh that out, but there should be some sort of indication that it has some sort of regulatory component. Uh, it should be feasible, and both from a scientific perspective, but also from a commercial perspective, right? Uh, again, we're gonna be going out to companies and asking them for their interest, for their willingness to join a project team and, and provide input, but also for their interest in providing funding or providing in-kind resources like reagents, materials, things that you might, we not, might not be able to fund, but might relieve uh, uh, an overburdened budget by, by getting materials uh, through in-kind donation. So those are all conversations we're going to have, and we want to be able to reasonably uh, describe the project and, and get their input. And then some final criteria that you may want to think of is, uh, as I mentioned, gating the, the project through different phases, maybe a proof of principle with, then later, um, with later phases and milestones in between can help us evaluate and help us decide if the full project is what we want to fund or if there's um, pieces of it that are, that are better suited for the biomarkers consortium. Uh, the balance and novelty of the idea uh, I imagine a lot of times we'll see multiple concepts that uh, interplay quite well or that might be might duplicate each other. And we might ask you to work with some of the other proposals that come in to combine some of those to look at similar objectives. Uh, think through resourcing and staff. Those are always big ticket items. Um, we actually do have limits on um, uh, indirect costs and, and, and fringe rates. And we'll go through all that through the project development process, but we try to keep our costs as low as possible and so we can look at your institution to make sure that they fit those requirements. And then um, think through the likelihood of being able to secure funding, right? If, if you don't think that it's a fundable project uh, from an industry perspective, we might have a hard time uh, getting there either. And that's what we really want to do is, is be able to sell these to, to companies who could potentially fund. And then I think, Last, oh yeah, right. So we have received a couple of uh, questions that have come in um, previously, and so we want to just go ahead and, and nip those in the buds so that we can get to uh, the Q and A session of this meeting. And I, I think this is it. So have your questions prepared, and we can kind of open up the discussion. Um, the first question was, how many partners are sufficient for an initial consortium? And the answer is more than one. If you um, again, if you're alone in your work, um, that should not preclude you from presenting a proposal, but we are going to find partners to work with you, or we're going to ask you to find other partners to work with as well. So uh, that's participating laboratories. Um, we would like to see multiple clinicians. We, as I mentioned, three public sector co-PIs and three industry partners are kind of a baseline that we like to see by the time of project launch. And then it's important to note that our group at FNIH and the Biomarkers Consortium and the High Content Data Integration Working Group will be working with you to find those partners and help um, address the proposal. Number two, are details of a follow-up plan needed as well as for a pilot? If there is, a, if you're using a pilot follow-up plan model, yes, we'd like to know um, what that's gonna look like. Uh, projects that are designed in phases tend to do very well in the Biomarkers Consortium. And, but we'd like to see some initial demonstration of what the potential for the platform is, and then what that continuation would look like, what the expansive project would look like, and then uh, what those, where those milestone decisions would fall, what they would look like, and what go-no-go -no -go criteria would be to determine those. So please include in your proposal the scientific strategy as far as the pilot and the phases go the experimental plan and technology, description of the technology will be helpful. And then uh, provide us a definition of what success might look like in your, in your aims or outcomes. Um, 
when it comes to platforms, I know there's a lot of technical data that can come across to kind of provide uh, a justification for why we should accept a proposal. At this stage, what we're looking for is an overview of your main objectives. So that technical information, what we will want it, but we'll probably want it later. So since you've got a, a three page maximum here on what, what you're gonna provide us, I would say, say that for later. You can indicate in there, we have lots of justification for why this platform is, um, is technologically sound. Great, that's sufficient for now. We'll come back to you and say, why don't you provide us that justification? But you don't need to feel like you have to input all of that information into a three page document at this point. Uh, go ahead and provide us a high level timeline of what it would look like with those milestones. So. Um, if you're thinking, I'm looking at a two-year project or a three-year project, let us know that. If we're totally off over time, it's probably going to change anyway. That's no big deal. But it gives us a sense that you're not looking at a decade's worth of funding or that, um, you know, the difference between a six-month and a three-year project is, is quite different. And we, we want to know that. And then a high-level budget to include all that information. Continuing on, number three is a two-step approach, uh, this pilot uh, followed by broader testing, appropriate as a response to this RFP or do we need to line up potential collaborations from the get-go? Um, a two-step approach is, is, is possible um, and you can include collaborators, uh, you know, please do include any collaborators that you're working with um, but just know that we will be exploring additional collaborations. We're going to want input from the HCDI working group. We're going to want input from the CSC. We're going to want input from the executive committee. And they're likely going to say, oh, you know, you could find samples at this site. You should bring in this person who's been working in this space. And so we're going to use that uh, community-based effort to really grow the approach that you put forward. Um, but go ahead and give us your, you know, your, your best proposal and then and we'll work from there. Can multiple proposals be submitted? Yes. As Althea mentioned, none of these proposals are in competition with each other. I think we have about 100 people on the call right now. If we get 100 proposals, it's possible that we can fund 100 proposals. It will be a lot of work for <laughs> the few people on the call and for the HCDI working group, but we will do our best. Um, and to, by the same point, there's not a cycle. Right. Um, we've tried to provide some dates that we'll get back to you by so that that way you know where the expectations are, some meetings that we know we're going to hold so that um, you're not just left uh, wondering what's going on. Um, but if, it, if you have a really great proposal and it takes us five years to turn that into a project plan, that's okay. We can do that. If as long as we have the bandwidth and we have the interest and we have um, the time to do it, we will do it. Um, and if you have three proposals that are going to take five years to put together, we can do that too. We obviously want it to be faster. We want to move as quickly as possible. And we'd like to ideally from the time of submission to the time of launch, uh, we'd like to get these in, in a 12 month window. If we could by this time next year, be ready for launch for your project, that would be ideal. Um, but we have the time and the interest to devote to your project as needed. And we're, we're going to do that. Can proposed projects address cancer-related areas outside of immunotherapy? Yes, certainly. Um, you're largely looking at the Cancer Steering Committee. We have projects in uh, imaging, both in um, nuclear imaging and, and, and radiology. We have liquid biopsy-based projects. We have big database projects. We have projects in hematology, in uh, MRD, and CGDNA, and liquid biopsy-based um, um, uh, base work. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite diverse. We pretty much cover all of the Cancer Steering Committee. What we've tried to do with our three challenges that HCEI has addressed is to really narrow down what we're looking for. If your proposal comes in and we think it's a really great fit for the Biomarkers Consortium, but it's not a great fit for this RFP, we'll probably tell you that and then direct you some other way or we can have a conversation about what we think might be helpful. We're gonna try and be responsive to all of you and let you know what we think are the best next steps for you. Um, and we'll just do our best to be, to be as honest and, and concise as we can with that, those directives. Uh, lastly on this slide, it is not required that you be US-based. We do have projects that are international. Uh, all collaborators can be international. The FNIH is based in Bethesda, Maryland. 
so there will be a US component to your project by the time it's done because we will be uh, helping you with it, but uh, it is not required that you are US based. And then last slide, I think. Okay, great. Q and A. Um, so Althea, anything I didn't cover or anything you want to address before we open it up to the group? I don't have anything else. That was great. Um, maybe we should actually take a quick moment to um, just let folks know that our the co-chairs for the working group for the HCDI working group are on the call right now. Um, Sean Hanlon is from NCI and Kiski Kuita is um, from SI and he represents uh, the kind of um, industry side. So we normally on our working groups we always have two co-chairs, one from the public sector, one from the private sector to kind of weigh in from their perspective and, and help us think things through. And so they're here to help answer questions as well. And then Susan Keating is a consultant from CCSA who has been working with this working group uh, longer than any of us really and has a lot of expertise on, on how we handle these. So. Um, between the five of us, I think we'll probably be the ones to weigh in and answer your questions. So uh, let's start with number one. I see a hand raised from Fred Hofberg. Yes, um, there are two questions. The first is, are the applications viewed with some preference if we identify who the project team might be as well as who potential funders might be? so that we go deeper into your thought process. And I have a second question. Sure. Um, I, I guess I'll take it if anyone else wants to jump in. So I wouldn't say given preference, but we definitely would appreciate that information, right? If you have ideas on who should be involved in the project, certainly let us know. And we definitely, over the course of project development, will be talking to you who appropriate funders are. So for one, We'll want to, the Cancer Steering Committee will be reviewing these, and there are 77 members of the Cancer Steering Committee from a variety of different companies, and so we'll be talking to them. But if at any point you say, well, you know, I don't see uh, AstraZeneca represented here, and I know that they would have a very big interest in my project, I'd really like to see you reach out to them. We're happy to do that. Uh, one thing for you to know is we don't want to stop any pre-existing relationships you have. We want, you, we want to support those. But one thing the FNIH can do is kind of serve as an honest broker. So when it comes time to ask for money, you as the investigator aren't going out and asking for funds. We can do that for you if you put us, um, kind of put us in between. And so we can, we, we have a development staff that will handle that, those discussions, but absolutely bring to the table anyone that you think could be supportive of the discussion. And the second question is, um, I love to make Gantt diagrams, but uh, how complicated do you want year two, three with go, no go criteria. Uh, it can fill up a whole page. Yeah, no, uh, at this stage, we don't need to do that at all. When we do the project plan, um, I think it'd be great to have a beautiful camp diagram that the executive committee could refer to and see where those, those decision points are. But at this stage, uh, given the, you know, the brief amount of space you have, I would say a couple sentences that says, we envision this is a three-year project. Uh, we see three phases. Uh, and years one, two, and three, and we'd like to have uh, go-no-go -go decisions after year one and year two, and we think you know these general criteria would, would suffice. That's sufficient at this stage. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dana, this is Susan. Susan. Uh, let me just look kind of sad. What often works well with these proposals because there is limited space is just to create tables um, with your with your uh, your um, timeline and your milestones measure milestones as well as maybe a table for your budget and justification. Yeah, if you can save space that way, feel free. Um, but I think just kind of a top line at this point, we'll, we'll ask you for details later. But this is really, at this stage, we just want to get a, a good sense of where, where you're headed. Um, okay, great. Next question from Mark Mamula. How is intellectual property managed between public and private participants? if any emerges during the project? Great question. As Althea mentioned, we don't do grants, we do contracts. And the way that a project is going to be set up is you can envision a kind of hub and spoke model where the FNIH sits in the middle and holds all contracts with all parties. So if you have your three industry partners, we're going to put together letters of agreement to ask them for funds. And the FNIH is gonna hold those agreements. And the terms that we use in those agreements will 
enable similar relationships across those organizations. And say you have three public sector co-PIs, we're going to develop research collaboration agreements with each one of those institutions, and we're going to use similar terms there. So we're asking for money to come in from industry, and then we are going to send the money out to uh, the research institutions. It's kind of as a clearinghouse. If there is um, donated goods, say reagents that you need or materials, a platform that you need to, to, um, to support your work, we'll develop a donated goods and services agreement. And we'll use similar terms there where we ask for a donation, we'll provide some sort of recompense. And each one of these partners, we use those contracts to bring on them as a project team member. So each of them will have a vote on how the project moves when we have those go-no-go -no -go decisions, those milestone decisions. Everyone will weigh in on what those decisions look like. The point is that the terms that we use in those contracts, because FNIH holds all the contracts, will be the same. And it creates a level playing field that everyone kind of feels safely that they're able to, okay, I, I can work with industry here, or I can work with NIH, or I can work with FDA, and everyone feels on the same page. So to your question, Mark, um, the FNIH works through several different policies that were handed down to us from HHS when we were founded by Congress in 1990. Uh, they cannot be changed. They're PDFs that uh, are a little outdated, but we do with them what we can, and we include those in all of our agreements. And those are uh, confidentiality policy that everyone adheres to. If you're working within the confines of a biomedical consortium, everyone's going to keep that confidential. A publication policy, bottom line is everyone's going to publish. Another one is IP and data sharing. The broad brush strokes of IP and data sharing are that if there is pre-existing IP um, that is brought to the project, basically donated to the project, um, no, the ownership of that IP does not change hands because of the project. Even though it will be used by the project team, the original owner of that IP remains the owner for its duration. If new IP is developed through the course of a project, what happens is the project team collectively owns that IP. And through the project team and the project team rules, which the project team will set up collectively, they will determine how that IP is handled. Um, I can't you know, give you a, a hard and fast, you know, this is how a, a patent application is gonna happen. But what I can tell you is that we have had cases in the past where we had 12 different partners work on a project, this was in hematology, um, and it was quite evident to the entire team that the IP that was developed from that project should be used for drug development. And it was quite evident who should do that. And the project team collectively acknowledged two of the partners came together. They actually um, submitted, <laughs> submitted a patent application and then were able to get a drug approval utilizing the technology that came out of the project. And I can also tell you that um, it sounds complicated and maybe a little wishy-washy, but I've never seen conflict arise out of a biomarkers consortium project because we spend so much time kind of curating the team itself. They tend to always want to work together, figure out you know what the end goal is and get there together that um, that discussion becomes quite clear in fact. Does that answer your question, Mark? Great, okay. Uh, Floyd Taub asks, can proposals address more than one of the challenges? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just let us know uh, what you think. Um, and sometimes we have seen proposals come in that say, this addresses challenge, challenge one, and then we review it and we think, no, it doesn't. This addresses another challenge. Um, we use that for categorization and to help us think them through, but um, you're not going to knock yourself out of the running by applying to more than one challenge or indicating uh, a challenge, right? It just really helps us to think through where they fit and how they'll fit. If it's a really good proposal, if it's something that we think is a right fit for the biomarkers consortium, we're gonna contact you and we're gonna try and help you work through how to, um, how to get it through. Next question from Peter Bell. Can you please restate the deadline for proposal and the timeframe for evaluation and earliest that a consortium can be established? So your proposals are due February 15th. Uh, we, there were several dates of the, I think, on a slide as far as meetings when we'd ask for you to come back and talk to us. We expect to be able to give you a determination about whether you will continue through this process in September, I think is what we said. Is that right? And then uh, I mentioned that uh, this process of project development, because you've got to recognize too, we're, we're going to spend the next few months trying to get in, getting through proposals. And so we'll be indicating to you 
whether you will be moving forward, whether we'll continue to review, whether we'd like you to come and talk to the group initially and provide a presentation, whether we have subsequent conversations, just to manage the proposals themselves in the next couple months. Once we determine that, yes, we really want to move your project forward, um, ideally, we'd like to keep project development within a year. We have seen them take much longer, depending on uh, how long it takes to get partners involved, how long it takes to contract, how long it takes to get the funding necessary. All of that's kind of malleable, uh, but we'll really shoot for a year. Peter, did I answer your question? Yep, Let's got it. Yep, yeah, thank you. Okay, great, great. Um, Mark Selmeyer says, will the slides be made available? Yes, we can send these out. I think what we're gonna try and do is we are recording this presentation. We're gonna try and post the recording and maybe the slides on the website where you found the RFP. We can follow up with, no, I guess we'll have to do that one. We? We'll have to post them because we don't have everyone's email address here. Yeah. Oh, Althea side. Yes, slides will be available. The presentation is being recorded. Yeah, so we'll post those on the website. Uh, we'll make sure that those are on the same page where you found, on the FNH website where you found the RFP. Um, someone asked, can you give an example of a project that was previously supported and at what stage exactly it was when it went through this process? Sure. Um, so in our... Last, I'm trying to think of the other RFP. So the thing to note is that the RFP process is relatively new for us. Um, as Althea noted in our, in our process slide, what we do is we develop working groups, the working groups develop concepts, and then the concepts develop, develop into plans through this process. Uh, only two years ago, I think, we thought, well, let's bring in some outside perspective. And so we issued our first RFP. We have one remaining concept. It was a much smaller RFP at the time. We had, I think, um, of 11 responses, we now have one concept that is continuing to go forward. It um, is in Kansas Steering Committee review right now, uh, in which we've sent them, they, they presented to the Kansas Steering Committee for the first time. They asked for, uh, I've asked for votes on whether that would go forward, a yes, no vote, and then we asked them for feedback. Can you provide feedback to the group? And so we're collecting that feedback now. I have nine companies who have responded and have provided uh, some input on which of uh, the, there's a three phase process, which of the phases are really pertinent and which are not. And what we'll do is in mid-February, we'll collate those responses and then we'll set them up for an executive committee review. So again, took a little over, about a year, I think, to get there. And then we've still got some work to do as far as refining that project plan. I think largely it was a question of really getting the right people in the room, again, finding the right partners to take part. Um, yeah, this is Susan again. Yeah, I just yeah. had a little note there. One of the interesting things about this is project is yes, it came out of our first RFP. Um, both the cl clinical challenges in that one and this one were actually put together by industry members. So that's a good thing for you folks to know is that um, these are these challenges are questions from industry that they would like help with. The other, the other thing is that this particular uh, project that Dana referred to is that that came in as a slightly different looking project directed at a different, um, slightly different question in, uh, we worked with it, an industry member suggested that that it be reformulated to answer a different question. And so this is a good example of industry and the academics working together to get get a project that it, that that was of, of interest and uh, really used to industry. So I would just <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Um, okay, Mark Watson asked. It sounds as though a less novel but more highly developed platform would be of greater interest than a more novel but less developed platform for this proposal request. Is that an accurate perception? Not necessarily. Um, I guess it, I guess it, the, it's really a question of um, what is more or less developed there. We will want proof of concept information. We will want to see that there um, 
it's not a fishing expedition as it were, or kind of product, early product development, let's say. So there should be some development that's happened and there should be some indication that we're working with technology that is supportive of whatever the, the aims are. Um, but novelty is something that we're looking at. And so each of the proposals will be judged largely on their own merits. If we think that there's a good confluence of those two factors, um, we'll, that'll be kind of a, a, a gut call on our on our part. I don't know if Sean or Kiski or Susan, if you have anything to add to that, but that's what I would say. Yeah, this is Sean. I guess I, you know, I, I guess there is some aspect of truth to that comment that, right, like, it, it, as far as um, we don't want something so early in development that it, you know, doesn't have some analytical validation. So, it, you know, uh, um, but I guess um, you know, novel, and that it's not just replicating. You know, not something it's slightly improving an existing technology um, probably isn't a fit. So, I, I think there is that balance of. Um, you know, it, it's adding a new capability, but there's some, you know, some some confidence in the, you know, performance of the of the platform. Since you know, again, the, you know, these are being supported by um, industry partners, um, you know, that, that don't want to fund super early work. Yeah. So uh, this is Case Kakuida from the ASI. Um, I just want to add. Um, I think you know uh, you guys have actually in a quite in a good like a novel uh, ideas. So I think it's more like you know the uh, from industry in a standpoint, uh, it's just kind of really difficult to find uh, like a pretty competitive space, and uh, you know something that would be good for the one company and uh, the other basically essentially the other company is not that interested in. So so that's actually just keep in mind. Um, you know we we actually presented in you know, some actually common thing. And, but uh, you know, if you actually uh, make a proposal and to uh, fit at the aim uh, to think about uh, you know the whatever you're going to propose, actually good for the uh, multiple companies. Yeah, that's a good point. Pre competitivity. I mean, I, I, yeah, the bottom line I think is that you're going to have to weigh in uh, novelty, development, and pre competitivity. Uh, okay, so we'll try to move on. We have 10 minutes and a few questions to get through. So uh, Althea in the chat has left uh, the dates here again. So the review period will be between February 15th and April 5th. We have calls planned for May 3rd, June 7th, or August 2nd. You should pencil in and uh, we'll hopefully be able to get back to you for a recommendation about next steps um, and suitability for kind of the, the full bore in September. But you'll hear back from us by April 5th, initially. Um, and Sean has linked here the link where the RFP can be found, and that's where we'll put the recording in the slides. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yoga Bella Garuna says, is there a template for proposal including font size, et cetera? If there's no template, then what type of and level of information should we have on information? Yes, there is a template. It is available at that link where Sean linked. Um, there's a downloadable document there, and you can use that document, and the font size is indicated there. Uh, Sean indicated some additional information about the example that we mentioned there, and there's a link there um, that'll help look through that. Mina Chandok says, can you please elaborate on the analytical validation versus feasibility with human clinical data as a minimum requirement? Please elaborate on the analytical validation. Uh, I, th I think the answer to your question is largely we're looking for um, indication of analytical analytical validity. Uh, so whatever you know, the work that you have done thus far, if there are any publications or um, or data that would indicate such. Again, at this stage, we're looking at an overview, so we want to we want to see uh, an indication of the validity. Um, or that analytical validation, and we can ask for the data later. You don't have to include it in all three pages. Um, we, we do like to see, I think as far as human clinical data goes, and it's important to keep in mind, we do not have great success in funding animal models. And we probably will not see great success here funding animal models or kind of early research that way. So if you have, uh, 
data from animal models and what you're looking for is to move into human testing or clinical testing, um, that's you're probably in a good spot. Or if you already have some human clinical data, that would probably be or human uh, data that would be put you in a good position. But keep that in mind, right? That's kind of the cusp on where we are. We're looking at translatability here, and um, we should be moving into the clinical space. And the, and the data that companies are going to be looking for is going to be clinical level data. So um, if you're not there, the proposal should be getting there. If you are there, that's great. I'm going to keep moving, but feel free to chime in here, Sean or Kispi, if you have anything you want to add. Uh, Marty Pagel says, many institutions require weeks to arrange formal inter-institutional agreements, which makes the February 15th deadline challenging. Can we propose collaboration with consortia by February 15th and follow up with more formal agreements later? My question may pertain to other institutions. Absolutely. We are not asking you to formulate any contracts or any formal agreements at all. You can certainly just submit your proposal as it is. We'll have months of time to be able to get those agreements. I totally agree with you. It can take weeks to get these uh, agreements together. Uh, contracts especially, that will take months later. So um, we will kick that down the road. That's not a problem. But go ahead and get your proposal and give us an idea of what it is that you're looking forward to doing. And then we can give you an idea about whether it's a good fit. Donna Alberti says, just to be clear, both industry and academic institutions can apply for this RFA. That is true. Um, we'd like to hear from both, and but either way, we're going to make a consortium out of both industry and academic partners, but regardless of where it comes from, it doesn't matter. Erez Nevo asks, do you have some sort of a template or required sections or recommendations on content for the proposal? Uh, yes, uh, that document is at that link that Sean sent, the RFP, so that's um, FNIH dot org slash csc dash hcdi dash rfp there is a downloadable document there that has all of the pieces included um appropriate trl range i don't know what this acronym means i apologize uh, so yahuda abrams if someone else wants to respond to that message uh or just clarify um, Anne Chen, will novel bioinformatics platforms be considered as novel platforms or only experimental platforms will be considered in this context? Examples would be the common scientific gaps could be filled or narrowed by novel bioinformatics platforms or machine learning approaches for challenges to enter. Um, we have seen bioinformatics platforms proposed before. We definitely do work in AI and machine learning. Um, I think that you're probably safe to submit a bioinformatics platform um, to this RFP if, you, if, you, if it sounds like it's appropriate for this call. Any objections to that, Sean or Christine? Hearing none. Uh, not, not at all. Yeah, that, that'd be great, okay. I think. Yep. Great. Uh, could novel tissue imaging platforms be for ex vivo analysis of primary tumor samples? Biopsy? Yes, absolutely. We think that uh, we are looking at um imaging platforms as non-invasive biopsies and we think that would be um uh great to see so yes please do submit that um please post the url to access the template but no template uh, sean posted the rfp page again and that is where you'll find your template sorry um, so, so yeah. just to clarify sean uh dale let me just jump in yeah, just to so clarify you know. um Folks, what we did is we didn't create a template in the RFP. We have a, in the RFP, there's a section that gives the list of what to put in your application. So all you have to do is create a Word document and with, a, a, with, a, with that information and it'll be good to go. Yeah, but you can use that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, right? If they, if they use that document, they can put their information into that, it's a Word document, right? They could use that, basically the RFP as the template. I thought that's what we did, no? Or is it a PDF? Is that the problem? It's a PDF, but you should be able to copy and put that into a new oh, product yes. pretty yes. easily. Yeah. So all the requirements are there. Just uh, send us a little document. Or you can send us a PDF, either version, however you want. Um, okay. Althea posted the direct link, so that's helpful. And Sean also posted the direct link, and we made it through the questions. Great. With four minutes to spare. Anything we didn't cover or questions uh, from the group? 
Okay, Reg Nevo asks, if it is not confidential, can you list industry partners that work with you in this consortium? Certainly, I would suggest actually that you go to the FNIH website and you look at the Biomarkers Consortium About page. There is a full list of the Cancer Steering Committee there. Uh, so all partners are listed. Uh, yeah, there's at least 70 that are listed there. You are going to see pharmaceutical companies, technology companies, biotechnology companies, uh, nonprofit organizations, patient advocacy organizations, all kinds of diversity. Um, so that'll give you a, a good idea of who we're working with. And again, if you don't see uh, an organization that you think should be involved in your project, through the course of project development, we'll have that conversation and we will absolutely help to reach out to them and get them involved. And Althea has linked that list in the chat that includes all the cancer stream community partners. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we will give you back some time in your day. Uh, we really appreciate everyone getting on. This is a great turnout. Uh, so glad to see that there's such interest in the RFP. We're really looking forward to seeing your proposals and uh, hopefully this has been, been informative. Again, we'll post this on the website. So if you have any questions, feel free to refer back. Althea, any closing words? Thank you all for coming. Um, and I don't have anything to add and thanks for a great uh, overview, Dana. Okay. Peter, did you have a last question? No, just thank you. I really appreciate it. You've oh, great. Um, great. made it very, very clear. Good, good. Thank you. Looking forward to collaborating. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.